Hello and welcome to another episode of Brains Behind AI. Today we have the pleasure of having with us Slater Viktorov. Slater is the founder and CTO of Fendico, an enterprise AI company for unstructured content. Slater has been building AI machine learning and deep learning solutions for the enterprise for the better part of the past decade, having worked with everyone from federal government to startups to Fortune 100 to then founding Indigo and getting it to 22 million in Series B raise. Slater, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Slater, before we dive into, you have an impressive resume and background here, but before we dive into the company, I just want to take a minute to learn more about your background. What got you interested in AI and machine learning and what, what got you where we, you are today? Absolutely, you know, and, and, and this is the place where I, you know, sometimes I joke, I'd love to be able to sit here and tell you that, you know, when I was a, a young college student, you know, I plotted out every every step, you know, along my journey really meticulously and, you know, everything was super, super intentional, but it, it absolutely couldn't be further from the truth, right? I think, uh, like a lot of people, you know, I sort of fell into this space uh, backwards and, and I would characterize it more as uh, love at first sight. Um, so the very first way I got into this space was just by total accident, frankly. Uh, so I was working at, you know, a Pearson company called Alleyoop that was this K through 12 readiness company. And a big part of their work was they would, you know, watch these videos and they had to categorize them in this really big learning taxonomy and say, you know, what part of biology is this teaching you? Uh, and I saw that, you know, people were doing this and, you know, it was thousands and thousands of hours of video. And I said, there has to be a better way. This just seems crazy to me. I didn't realize at the time that it was a machine learning problem. Um, so, so that was the very, very first way I got into it. And, you know, this was uh, 2012. Uh, so traditional sort of NLP type techniques. I was primarily working on sort of titles. I was, you know, lucky enough to get a pretty good result in named entity recognition. Um, and then uh, that eventually is what turned me on to what, you know, eventually turned into Indico, which was me and my co-founder, uh, Alec Radford, started doing these Kaggle competitions together uh, when I got back to school the next year. Nice, nice. So now speaking of the company, right, uh, it, it seems like you came across um, a place where machine learning could be applied, but you didn't, how did you sort of find out or how did you come to a realization that this is a machine learning problem and machine learning can handle it at scale. Yeah. So the, the, the way I would kind of describe the process, right? So we're, we're in 2012 and at the time I'm very, very familiar with uh, traditional ML techniques. In fact, I said to my professor, you know, that year, uh, and I'll never forget this quote, the war is over deep learning lost. Right. Uh, and in 2012, I, that wasn't even a particularly strange opinion to have. Right. And, you know, mm -hmm. I just believed in it so confidently. And, you know, as a sophomore undergraduate that it had some success, obviously I knew everything there was to know about the field. Um, so, so, you know, like I said, I started doing these Kaggle competitions uh, with, with my friend Alec. And for the first six months, I was feeling pretty good about my outlook, right? These traditional techniques were working really, really well. Uh, and while Alec sort of had a, big sort of love of deep learning, I was kind of like, oh, you know, that that's cute. You know, you can do that, you know, over on the side and, you know, we'll be doing the real, real stuff over here. Uh, but something really interesting happened after the first six months. And, you know, this, this kind of very closely mirrored the development of deep learning in academia, right? You know, AlexNet in 2012, sort of the shot heard around the world. Uh, so the same thing happened here where, uh, you know, after the first six months, basically, we never submitted another traditional uh, machine learning technique again. Uh, deep learning sort of came into its own and it was just so radically better than what came before for the kinds of problems that we were very, very interested in that that, that was sort of the spark, right? Uh, and, and then something really interesting started happening because we were doing very well in these Kaggle competitions and, you know, we had started shipping these deep learning techniques into production, which was something that, again, at the time, very, very few people had done. Um, we started getting people reaching out, asking if we wanted to do projects together. And, and that, in so many ways, that was, you know, the very genesis of Indico was we tried to take this deep learning technology, tried to bring it out to these, these customers and realized that there was basically this massive gap, right, between what was possible in academia, 
right? And what was possible out in industry, right? Uh, and then, you know, to, you know, fast forward a little bit, we, we did sort of this deep uh, sort of investigation, figured out, okay, how do we kind of bridge that gap? How do we take this incredible technology? And, you know, we've seen, you know, obviously what this can do in academic settings. How do we make it actually practical, uh, you know, tractable and, and useful to people in, uh, in industry? And we found this area that back then in, you know, now we're talking 2013, was extremely niche. Basically, nobody had heard of it called transfer learning. Um, that I always say it, it's sort of the art and science of reusing portions of old models to solve new problems with less data. Uh, and there were some really, really cool papers that came out that basically showed, you know, you could get the accuracy of these deep learning models with, you know, one one thousandth the amount of data that you would previously require. And, and that sort of technology, you know, there's sort of a, you know, it's easy to say it's sort of quick to learn, lifetime to master sort of field, right? That that became, you know, the big piece when we said, you know, hey, we think we can build uh, sort of a whole company around this idea of transfer learning, sort of making this technology more accessible, right? Uh, and, you know, uh, you know, that's where the roller coaster starts. Got it, got it. So you know, we continue the journey, right? And then where did you go from there? Yeah, so our, our first idea, and you know, we were we were college students at the time, uh, you know, we're now getting around to our junior year, and the most ambitious we could possibly imagine here, right, in terms of making this technology accessible was let's bring it to uh, developers, right? And of course, you know, developers in our mind meant, you know, like undergraduate computer science student, right? Um, and and, and we built a developer facing product, sort of this series of APIs that were actually, you know, very, very usable and developers really, really enjoyed them. You know, you probably remember, you know, 2014, 2015, there were a few offerings like this, sort of Alchemy API, stuff like this, where you could call, you know, sentiment analysis of a piece of text, get these results back. And that was the first time really that these, these models were that radically accessible. Um, and, you know, we made some really significant advances in sort of the usability of that API. Um, and that API got enough user traction that we were accepted into Techstars. Um, but while users really liked it, while we got very, very good at designing APIs and getting good at this technology, we found that ultimately, uh, actually, it was a very bad uh, business model for the kind of technology that we were taking to market. And the principal reason for that, and you know, this is then what, what sort of leads to uh, Indico V2, um, is that Deep learning really is in a lot of ways a game changer. Um, unstructured data isn't something that people have been able to work with effectively before. And, you know, unstructured data, I mean, text, images, mm -hmm. videos, audio, right? That's always been kind of, uh, you know, too, too difficult to deal with uh, in traditional software. And when you actually add deep learning into that mix, you change the game in a really, really fundamental way. You can get after a lot of these, you know, unstructured reasoning tasks that you just couldn't before. Um, and, you know, so, so that, that kind of then uh, changes how the business has to look at things. It's not the case that the business is just sort of like handing things to developers and saying, go look for a solution that does X, X right, just a widget. Uh, you know, what we find much more often is that sort of the technical side and the business side have to come together to create a solution that actually, you know, makes both of them successful. Um, and so that was, that was kind of the gap. And that's sort of where we missed things in the first go around. It was not enough to simply bring things to uh, the developer without a PhD. We actually sort of came away recognizing that we had to go much, much further and actually make this accessible to even non-technical subject matter experts. So, so it, help me understand, what was the product? Call it the version 1.0 that you made available to the developer. What was that offering? Right. So think, you know, sentiment analysis API, named entity recognition API. You know, we had several dozen of these kinds of APIs, uh, you know, along with SDK. So they were these big, you know, hosted static models that you would just call, uh, you know, send it some text, get a sentiment value back. Again, you know, we had named entity recognition. We had political alignment detection. We could do even, you know, Myers-Briggs persona recognition based on text. Uh, you know, again, you know, sort of few dozen of these, mostly text based, uh, a few on the image side as well, you know, you think things like facial recognition, you know, facial emotion recognition, stuff like that. Um, yeah, so, and yeah. again, sort Got of all So mostly the, the, the unstructured text, NLP type of use cases um, packaged in a box with APIs, right? Exactly, yeah. 
Yep. yep. Got it. Got it. All right. So now let's speak. Let's talk about the version two Dado. So yeah. what is what is the what, what is the next iteration? What's the next version? Yeah. So and and this I would say we kind of had this realization about three years ago, right? Is that we sort of believe that this uh, you can think of you know the black box widget model of AI, if you will. We just sort of came away saying like, okay, we executed on that model really, really well, and we think it's a fundamentally bad model. <laughs> Uh, so we instead sort of said, okay, what we actually want to do is create a platform that allows people to create their own models, right? That gives them full transparency into the model that they are building, right? And actually gets them in production. Um, so that leads to sort of the vision of Indico 2.0, right? Which is a product, you know, it still has the APIs of, of the last generation. So we build on top of that. But uh, first and foremost is this product that faces the non-technical subject matter expert that makes it very intuitive for them to create these models that then process unstructured content. Right. So, you know, document extraction APIs, you know, email classification models, right, uh, object detection, you know, sort of whatever have you, you know, the goal really being giving that non-technical user the very, very intuitive interface into like, how do I train this thing? How do I control it? How do I understand what it's doing? Got it. Got it. So now, is it is it safe to say it's a platform now? Have you, you know, I, I think that this approach or no? My 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 initial answer is going to be yes. You know, but but I'll I'll uh, you know pull myself back a little bit because I think everyone wants to be a platform. So while yes, the platform component is is really really important, we see three key areas that we're also you know sort of delivering solutions along. One is automation. Obviously, that's huge. Uh, you know, intelligent process automation, intelligent document processing, sort of all bundled around in the RPA area. So that that's a really really big market for us. You know, just to be tangible about it. Uh, another big one is uh, analysis, right? So you can imagine unstructured analysis. You know theme extraction, email classification, plugging into you know, employee NPS, stuff like that. So analysis is kind of the second really big tranche. And then the third one for us is applications. And that's a little bit what I was talking about previously, where people are you know, designing next generation search interfaces, right? Uh, just sort of reimagining the idea of, you know, how could we do customer onboarding? How can we reimagine some of these you know, legacy applications with some of this more intelligent functionality that we can now easily build on top? Got it. So let me do this. Let me just restate that. I want to make sure we understand, yeah. right? So, um, so for instance, I'm a data scientist or run a company where we have some unstructured data that we want to do natural language processing on and do some sentiment analysis or email classification. What I can do is I can bring my data to Indico and then be able to use your technology to build the models and and hopefully models that that are a lot more efficient and can work with less data data to to be able to um uh, and it to be able to get to what i need the the model to do and then once it's done it's uh, it's it's all, it's an api based access right uh, so is, that, is that a good is that is that the right summary those are key pieces, but there's a bit more to it. Okay. So I'd maybe like add a little. So sure. first and foremost, the person coming to us is almost never a data scientist. Um, so much more commonly, you are, say, a lawyer today who is, uh, say, searching through contracts for a certain kind of indemnification language, right? So, you know, you've got some unstructured data, these contracts. You're trying to do some analysis to it, you know, finding these indemnification clauses. Um, so then the idea is, you know, and then and then from there, you know, it's pretty much right. You know, you get your contracts, you load them into Indico, and then the really key piece is you've got this actual, you know, product UI where you, as the non-technical person, can just say, "This is the clause I care about." Here's how I would characterize it. And you, again, you sort of specify this in a very, very user intuitive way. And then you've got these models that can learn with very, very small amounts of data that then are automatically being trained on the background. And then, you know, once you've done 
a couple dozen examples, they sort of come to life. And then you start doing this kind of assisted process, right, where, you know, you've got predictions, so it starts to go much, much faster. And then, you know, at a certain point, uh, you know, once you've got to a couple hundred of these, you can usually start to do, you know, uh, these by itself, uh, you know, but, it, but it's a bit of a trade off, we like to call it sort of a bionic arm for knowledge workers is another way to think about it. So it's really the, the unstructured work that knowledge workers are doing today, uh, you know, more transparent, better, faster, they get to spend the time on the cool parts and not on the boring parts. Got it. So is it is it safe to say that it's a no-code or low-code offering where, as you mentioned, a lawyer can come in and bring, bring a data or bring a clause and say, this is what it means, this is what I want to apply, and then uh, um, yeah. have the NLP do its magic? Yeah, absolutely. So for the the non-technical, you know, the, for the subject matter expert, it's a no-code experience, really, for them. Um, there is, you know, we, we find it in practice, right, the enterprise is always a bit complicated. So, you know, even though building the thing uh, can be no code, you still got to plug it in usually to APIs on the back end. So there is still then that rich API. So then it'll usually be a low code integration to downstream systems. Um, sometimes, you know, people might have, you know, an RPA vendor or something like that. So then there's an integration. Uh, but I would still characterize that as, as low code, even though. Got it. Uh, so. so so the true value proposition is the low code and and be able to work with the um, fewer da uh, data. If you don't have a lot of data and you still want to build good models with high confidence interval, you can come and leverage your technology and APIs there. Yeah, and, and I would say that the you know smaller amount of data is you know a key enabler, but you actually get a lot of benefits sort of through the model development lifecycle. Um, so, you know, that's a key piece, but then the, the net is that um, building models for unstructured data is just a very, very hard thing. And what we find mm -hmm. is that in practice, you're constrained by the number of iterations you can make. So, you know, the data is really, really key piece, but it also means that your iteration time for a model goes from, you know, it might be a person decade, honestly. You know, it's not strange to have 10 data scientists working on one key model for a year, you know, that, that that's really before it gets to production, right? Um, and you instead shrink that cycle time down to two weeks. Um, and, you know, because the first model you ship is not always the correct one. You usually have to go mm -hmm. through, you know, four or five, you know, versions till you get to, you know, mm -hmm the perfect version of that model. And so by drastically cutting that cycle time down, uh, you know, you can get after all of the unstructured use cases kind of across the enterprise much, much more quickly. Got it, that makes sense. Now, what is your business model? How are, how do you license it? What, what, how does it work? Yeah, so we've got two uh, main modes that we license in. One is as a managed service. Uh, so, you know, you can imagine like all of these solutions are going to be pretty compute intensive. So, you know, there we've got a private cluster for the customer that we manage on AWS, you know, scales up, scales down. And then there's uh, sort of, they, they just pay for the uh, hardware that that is hosted on. Um, and then there's also a uh, rate card for sort of the capacity that they're pumping through the application. Um, and, and sorry, and that's capacity both in terms of, you know, the number of images and documents and, you know, emails they pump through the system, as well as the number of users they have on it. So it's actually primarily a seat based uh, model. Um, with, you know, sort of compute as a backdrop to that. Uh, we also do support, though, a fully on-premises version. So some customers, they want to manage it themselves. Uh, you know, it's a fully kind of Kubernetes managed microservices architecture. So we can actually uh, pass it over to IT companies to manage uh, on their own. You know, I would say 80% of our customers probably manage service, 20% uh, run the on-premise. Makes sense. And, and I, I know you mentioned as an enterprise solution, how big does a customer have to be to leverage it? For instance, I'm thinking lawyers, right? Mm -hmm. Can can a lawyer a law firm with three lawyers leverage your solution, and is it cost effective for them, or do I have to be a 500 for people yeah, firm? Th three lawyers, almost, almost certainly not, right? So we're definitely enterprise centric. You know, our, our customers are. You know, we, we've got quite a few in the Fortune 100, and I would say all of our customers are in the Fortune 1000. Um, you know, I, I would say that it, it varies a bit. I, I, I think that right now, um, what really dominates people's mentality around it, which is very, very reasonable, is the risk associated with these projects, right? 
Um, so, you know, if you just do the math out, so, you know, our, our average price for the platform is, you know, a few hundred grand a year, uh, just to make the math easy, call it, you know, a quarter million of dollars a year, right, which would be a reasonable starting price for a customer. Now, the failure, the, the, or rather, I'll say the success rate for um, unstructured projects in the industry overall is, depending on who you ask, is between 25 and sort of 35%. Right. So, you know, you're thinking maybe between a quarter and a third of these projects are succeeding. Um, what that means is that for it to even be worth it to go after uh, a use case, right, they have to be making, you know, at least a million dollars back, right? If it costs, you know, 250 and, you know, it's only going to have a one in four chance of success. Um, and so it's a, it's a bit of a risk appetite. So us personally, for instance, we actually have a success rate of about 97%. Um, and so, and, which is, you know, very, very exceptional. So what we see actually happens usually is that it's hard to get customers to make that first decision. You know, we usually have to show them like a, you know, $10 million kind of savings, you know, or really just kind of eye popping number where they say, look, you know, the risk is worth it. You know, we're going to go after this. And then once they see the success, actually the bar gets, you know, much, much lower for successive use cases. Um, so it's a little bit of a fuzzy angle. What I will say is that what's most important for us is the size of someone's uh, kind of automation deployment. So a smaller company can get a lot more value if they've got a more mature IT infrastructure. Um, but you know, you still have to be thinking in terms of you know hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars a year that this is going to save you before it's. Uh, you have to look at what your ROI is going to be on the investment. Exactly. And, and exactly. you're looking at if it doesn't have like a million dollar worth of value, it's probably and not within their range, right? Right. It's probably, you know, it, there's enough risk. It's going to take enough to get, you know, and, and they're also a, a, you know, multidisciplinary project. So it has to be enough to get people excited about the project and actually, uh, you know, ensure you'll get to success. Maybe, you know, use case three and four and five don't have to be quite that high, you know, because you, you've gotten a lot better at it. Um, but certainly for that first use case, you know, yeah, you want to be thinking, multi-million dollar ROIs. Got it, got it. Now, sort of in terms of your market, right, and starting a startup is hard, finding the first customer and then product market fit, and it seems like you've gone through a couple of iterations there. Oh, yeah. What What is your sort of our target, uh, or what, what is your niche? Do you Did you have a niche focus when you started? If yes, what was the niche focus? So the... You know, niche, I think, is is a bit of a spectrum. I, I would say we certainly chose uh, vertical from a go-to-market perspective. And I think this is one of the things that's really tough uh, about AI technology in general is that the technology can be applied to pretty much anything, right? So from a technological perspective, it, it's not even that people are unwilling to choose a vertical. It's that uh, your technology is actually worse if you choose a vertical, and it's very, very hard to. Like, generic technology works very, very well in the AI space today. Um, but it's totally, totally impractical as a young company to do, you know, a fully horizontal go-to-market. You just can't do it, right? You boil the ocean. You know, one of our investors says, uh, startups die of indigestion, not starvation. And I just, I absolutely agree. So we looked really closely at which industries, you know, have these high ROIs, who owns their data, who is, you know, ambitious to get after these use cases. And, you know, what was really important to us also is that you'll tie yourself in knots, figuring out what is the perfect vertical to go after. Uh, we always knew that there were going to be several more verticals for us. So the question was much more, what is good enough for our first market? And we started in BFSI, so banking, financial services, and insurance, um, and, you know, had, had several kind of landmark customers there, right? I mean, it, it's a big industry, you know, high sort of leverageability across customers. You know, we've expanded a bit out from that, you know, property and casualty and real estate into, you know, adjacent markets from there. One of the other things that's really interesting is that almost any company of sufficient size, even if you talk Walmart, you know, obviously Walmart is not a BFSI uh, company on its face, but Walmart is, you know, the largest insurer in North America, just because once you get to a particular size of company, a certain part of your operations uh, become, you know, you have to operate like a financial services organization in, in some respect. So that's also given us a really easy way to sort of explore new verticals opportunistically, right, you know, go in through sort of the finance department where we've got all of these, you know, well, well reified use cases to figure out, hey, are there good adjacent things that we can go into in this, in this space yeah. as we expand? 
Yeah, no, that's that's very interesting. And the reason I like to ask is I've seen way too many times where um, the entrepreneurs get initially excited about technology and all the way and all the verticals it can be applied to. And they end up trying too many things across too many industries. Yeah. So they're not very deep in, within a vertical, but they, um, they, they kind of spread around and that ends up creating a little bit of lack of focus and distraction from from moving forward, right? I, I think especially with, with technical co-founders, because you know the MVP is always really, really broad. Obviously, mm-hmm. that is exciting. And I, I think part of it is also folks tend to um, underestimate how much work the go-to-market motion is, right? Because signing one customer in a vertical is super easy. Right, you know, and, and that that's almost that's almost the honeypot, right? So you almost get trapped in that because you get the one customer. But it's not right. about getting one customer. It's about, hey, we need a repeatable motion where a salesperson, not the CEO, can go sign customers 10 through 20 through 50, right? Exactly. And and they're and those two things are just worlds apart. And I think that's what a lot of entrepreneurs miss. It's about scale. Yeah. It's like, how are you going to get there? How are you going to speak their language? Even if your technology can do everything perfectly, you still have to get the message to the right people, right? You still have to communicate in their language and, and you know, again, get on the same page with these people. Right. So uh, that's, this is great. And now in terms of what use cases you support or what type of verticals do you support, how would you describe it, sort of broadly speaking? What are some of the capabilities or use cases you have? Yeah, so we've got, uh, and you know, I guess I'll just first say if folks are interested in getting into detail on this, we've got a lot of you know case studies and stuff on the website that are cool to go through just to see kind of the broad applicability of this technology, which is kind of cool. Um, the way that we sort of segment our use cases is automation use cases, analysis use cases, uh, and application use cases. And automation has been a really, really common thing for us. Um, so I would say automation use cases are the most common ones for us, right? And that's where you have uh, often it'll be sort of a VPO firm and they've got kind of a really, really regimented process where they're going from uh, usually a document to a structured data bundle, right? Um, and, you know, it's an extraction model and it's a human in the loop kind of review. So I would say that's that's a really common sort of framing. Uh, talking about specific documents, you can think lease documents, you can think, again, contracts are very, very common. Uh, you know, one one frame of use case that is, uh, again, very common is often when you are agreeing to contracts as a very large company, um, you don't know what's going to be relevant in the future. So let's say, you know, marketing says, hey, uh, we want to go out to all of our existing customers of X product uh, and we want to sell them this new product. Well, maybe when you sign the original contracts, right, you didn't pay attention to whether, you know, the marketing rights, because it was just not not relevant, right? Folks were just trying to get the deal signed somewhere one side or the other. You know, that's a place where you're like, okay, great, you know, let's use Indico, build a model that's going to help us, you know, churn through our, you know, thousands of contracts that we've got, figure out where they all are, right? Uh, so a lot of the time they spin up in this sort of ad hoc way, you need to do a kind of contract analysis, right? Or you need to search through, uh, let's say, annual reports for a specific kind of data that has just become relevant. Uh, so, you know, for, for instance, uh, you know, GDPR is a great example, you know, GDPR regulations, what the impact is going to be, people need to do analysis, of privacy statements of contracts. So th- that's like a quick sampling, right? Um, you can imagine, you know, invoices is sort of the classic example that everyone talks about, you know, that that's another good one. Right. Uh, but you know, obviously that's, that's kind of on the simpler side. Got it. Now, sort of, as I think about it, right. As I think about use cases, especially whether it's HR finance and automation, uh, what I've personally seen is there is this talent shortage to help implement and enable it. Absolutely. So my question to you is, is Indigo a tool or, or a slash platform, or do you also bring in consulting services and people that can actually show and enable and do some of that automation? I, so I, absolutely, 100%. So I'll say on on two fronts, because I, I guess this is this is a space where we're just sort of like, the more sophisticated the market is, the better educated people are, the better a company in our position is going to do, frankly. So we actually see it as a big corporate initiative. You know, how can we get people educated more quickly? How can we address these talent shortages, right? Because again, that just that just helps us, right? Um, so I would say today we do a little bit of everything, 
Um, so one really big piece is because there is this massive talent shortage. It's part of why I said that usually the person doing that work is not a data scientist at the start. Because a data scientist has so much on their plate today. Um, they really only want to be brought in like right before something is going into production, right? Like they don't, they don't want sort of new work. So a lot of sort of our, our innovation here is pushing more of that work out to the edge to uh, Gartner sort of calls them citizen data scientists. Um, you know, I'm a really big fan. There's this term that Microsoft uses machine teaching, you know, as opposed to machine learning, which is, again, it's all about putting that act of teaching and that sort of human centric mode to, you know, AI, cent uh, AI instruction, right, as, as the center of the target. Um, and so that actually, it changes the labor model really drastically. You know, it allows, again, this business user who has the really proximal problem to get 90% of the way to the solution. So that's one really, really big piece of it. But, you know, then there is also, for instance, uh, the automation COE uh, or center of excellence. That's becoming a big function at these companies that are, um, they're certainly technical engineers. They're more infrastructure, you know, plugging APIs into things. They're not building new applications. So another thing that we found is really important is just how do you make it as easy as possible to create these integrations? So, you know, we've invested in a GraphQL API, for instance, that makes that uh, dramatically easier. Um, and, you know, we do, and, and basically the way that we see it is you need those people and usually a data scientist for governance um, as your minimum set of folks to get something out into production. And then we will sort of uh, like plug holes in that with consulting services where the customer, you know, maybe they don't have a subject matter expert that they can, you know, get on immediately, right? Or maybe they need a data scientist to, you know, pinch it for them for, you know, two months in model management before they hire their own, right? So we'll kind of paper over some of those gaps for the customer and consulting services. Uh, and yeah, and, and we and we spend a lot of time educating them, usually, honestly, even earlier in the sales cycle, just helping them understand how do you evaluate these tools? How do you frame a use case? How do you think about ROI? Because even those basic things, you, you'd be shocked how many times we, we ask a customer, how are you going to justify this purchase? How do you frame the ROI? And they just don't know, right? Uh, and I think it's a thing that a lot of people go in with the wrong mentality of like, oh, well, if we just automate 100% of this thing, then everything is great. It's like, it's not how anything works, right? Like, you know, you're much better off thinking like, how does acceleration turn into dollars? You know, is turnaround time here more important? Is throughput more important? Is scalable growth more important? Is auditability and risk or error reduction more important? Each one of those is going to lead to a different ROI. And tell you that you want to construct this process in a slightly different way. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I'm going to switch gears and sort of start talk about sales here for a second. Yeah. Um, you mentioned your Fortune 100 clients, right? And, and I've, I've, I saw some of that. Uh, my question to you is, how does a startup, a small startup out of Boston, get Fortune 100 clients? Oh. What's this recipe? Is there a secret sauce? Uh, uh, grit and determination, frankly, is, I, I mean, the enterprise sales cycle is, I mean, it's, it's brutal. And I think that that's what a lot of people don't realize is like people go into an enterprise sales cycle, believing that there's stuff that they can do to make it go faster. Uh, and when you go into an enterprise sales cycle, you just have to recognize that 12 months is a good case scenario, right? Uh, and, and you can't put all of your eggs on those baskets, right? You have to recognize that, especially in your early years, right, it may take two or three years to go from a prospect to a signed deal. Um, so, so, you know, MetLife, for instance, and, you know, they're one of our biggest sort of most, uh, you know, public customers, you know, it took us two and a half years from our first meeting to our first deal. So, I mean, that's, again, as so much as it's a secret sauce, right, it's, you have to have a really mature product. You have to understand how to document things. You have to understand, you know, just the, the complicated engine that is the enterprise, that there's going to be, you know, eight different stakeholders that have to sign off on what you're doing. And any single one of them can say no, right? Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. That That's the main piece. Is, is, I mean, it, it's tough. It's an absolute grind. The, the secret is just sticking with it, frankly. Yeah. How do you sort of open door, right? Even sort of getting in is hard, right? Uh, and starting the conversation. You know, starting the conversation I found is 
by far the easiest part of it. Right. Um, you know, and, and that's everything from like, there are literally agencies you can just pay that will get you meetings with Fortune 500 companies, right? It, it's actually, it's a very easy thing to do. Um, what's much harder is getting the right conversation started, right? And, and that, you know, I think that's an important distinction, right? Is like very easy to go and, and waste your time with innovation groups, right? And it's actually, you know, if your goal is just to like, meet with someone at these Fortune 500 companies. Again, very easy to do. Um, what we have found, and actually what's a huge benefit for us, um, is something that's becoming a lot more popular called account-based marketing. Uh, and it's basically hyper-targeted, very, very individualized, where you go like company by company and you create content for that company, right? You, you track, okay, you know, we want to get into American Express. That's a key account. Uh, there's platforms that you can buy that basically track whenever someone from an American Express shows up on your site. So one of the things that you can do is you can kind of time the outreach, right, with their landing on your site. That kind of increases things. But again, it's part of it is just volume, right, is that the more contact points you get at the company, eventually you break through, eventually you figure out who knows who and you can, you know, get lucky with timing. Um, but one of the things that we found is actually a lot of those outbound motions did not work very well. Um, and at least for us, and, and this I think is different, you know, for every industry, for us, it's hyper, hyper timing dependent is like, it doesn't do us any good unless we happen to, you know, hit the right person at the right time. So what has actually been working much better for us? And this is, you know, a, a change probably in the last three months is we did this hard shift to inbound, just content production, content production, content production. Cause the idea is that if, if we can put out high quality content and then someone from a target account hits it, then we know that they're much more likely to be at the right point in their buying cycle. Still doesn't mean it's going to be hundred percent. Right. But it means that we're jumping from, you know, 10, 15 percent. Right. Or, or, you know, maybe a 50, 50 chance that a first meeting is going to go well to like a 90 percent chance that the first meeting is going to go well. Right. So creating more content around what you have. So it's more of a yeah. pull than a push. Right. That is that's that has helped a lot, though, you know. It, it, just like like all aspects of the enterprise sales cycle, it's you know you got to invest heavily in it, and it takes a while for it to pay off. It takes a while, but but the good news is most of it is evergreen once it's out there, right? People can it's, hit it's, it it's, even it's down the road too. We think about it like a portfolio, honestly. So we we kind of delineate very clearly, like we've got content that is evergreen, and we've got content that's really topical. Um, and, and it's weird. And, and we've been really surprised, honestly. There's stuff that we thought would be super topical that has turned evergreen and, and vice versa. Yeah. No, that's 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 a great advice. Now, let, uh, talking about challenges, right? Um, and I know we touched on it, some of it earlier. What would you say was one of the biggest challenge in building an AI company and, and getting it to a point where it is? Oh, uh, yeah. The, the, the toughest part, obviously, is choosing the biggest one. You know, as you said, there's just so many. And I think, you know, the piece of advice I always give uh, young entrepreneurs and first time founders is no matter how hard you think it is, it's harder. Um, you know, what I would say is that, you know, other than that, obviously, of just sort of like the grit and the grind, there was this one saying, I think it's from Jeff Bezos. I'm not 100% sure. I heard it from our CEO, which was um, ultimately creating something new and being successful in creating something new is uh, patience in being misunderstood. Um, right. And, and it's kind of this weird, and, and especially, I think, I, and I, I Look, I've been at this for a long time, right? I was pitching Transflooring again seven and eight years ago, and I would say that our market is just now early, right? So eight years ago, you know, like I would walk in and people would have absolutely no idea what I was talking about, uh, especially me, you know, kind of a young guy. I would go in and I would be in the really difficult position of having to tell someone who got a PhD 20 years ago that... They were wrong about the state of things and, and not even like subtly wrong, just like gratuitously wrong. Like you'd have people whose notions of neural nets never advanced beyond, you know, a multi-layer perceptron, which is like a hello world from the 80s, right? Um, and, and, it, and it was just a really, really hard position to be in, right? And, and 
I was not very good at it to start, right? I got better at it with time, but as good as it, as good as you are, you're always going to have situations where you, you basically get into a screaming match with folks, right? Where people just totally misunderstand what you're saying. They're built on totally wrong information. They'll chew you out and make you feel like an idiot in front of really important people, right? Um, and it's, it's a part of the game, right? You know, so much of it is just like, that's going to happen. Um, you know, check what they said, like, make sure that you're right. Feel very, very confident in what you're saying and have the evidence to back it up. You know, that's what matters at the end of the day. But just as important is realizing like, yeah, there, there is just a, a portion of people that are in very, uh, you know, high up impactful areas that are just morons, right? They have absolutely no idea what they're doing. They're just these political masterminds that have, you know, failed upwards into these positions of power. And, and like, don't take it personally, you know, it's just, it's going to happen. And again, it's about picking yourself, yourself up, right. Going on to the next one and saying, okay, you know, like that one, maybe I couldn't have done right. But the next time I'm going to, you know, change X, Y, and Z to, to, you know, do that much better. Um, that, that was the hardest for me, like, like far none. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's some really good advice there. Yeah. So now I'm sort of talking about the future of the company, right? What do you see Indigo become in the next, say, three to five years? Yeah. So, you know, we have recently kind of evolved past this document centric uh, positioning really into the unstructured data platform. Right. And that's actually that's really big because no one no one right now out there has been bold enough to say that they can actually kind of solve the full unstructured problem. Right. Um, and so that obviously is a really key piece for our three to five year vision. I think that today where you often see customers kind of getting after unstructured data in this very, very piecemeal way where it's like, oh yeah, that guy in the corner has a hugging face model and maybe I've been playing with Spacey and this guy knows about Prodigy, right? Um, I, I think that companies are not going to be comfortable adopting technologies in that way anymore. Um, I think just like we're seeing some people start to care about responsible AI and this transparency and these problems of bias, I think that those concerns are rising as the production applications ratchet up. Right. And, you know, it's something that has always been really, really important for us at Indico is why we built explainability and transparency into sort of the very foundation of our product. Um, I think that you're going to see that become radically more important. I, I think that people are really going to start to shift to these the, the same way you saw you see in structured data, how people have adopted, you know, data bricks and data robot. Right. And these these universal clean governance solutions that allow them to have transparency. In what's going into production You're going to see that same thing on the unstructured side. Uh, of the space, right? That, that, that's my view. I think Gartner is going to come up with a new space around it. I think one of the things that I'm also just incredibly, incredibly excited about is that today um, people think about models very much in a way where you're training models often from scratch. I think that whole idea is going to go away. I think that people are going to think about models in terms of lineages like, oh yeah, this one started on top of GPT-2 and then I fine tuned it with this data and you know it'll be three to five pops down the line that you actually get to whatever you're using. That and sort of this big, big trend of multimodal AI, which is, you know, rather than just saying, you know, text is dealt with with NLP, you know, images are dealt with in computer vision, right? And never the two shall meet. You're starting to see a lot more of these techniques that actually fuse image and text information, that fuse audio and image information. And that's, you know, certainly when we start talking about the future of unstructured, I think that's where right now, um, it's just too hard to get after a lot of those applications. I think that changes a lot in the next three to five years. And, and you can kind of, you know, imagine the sort of really, really exciting things that that enables. But I think those are some of the things that, again, can't really get after them today. In three to five years, right, I, I think you're going to start seeing some really, really impactful applications. Yeah, exciting. Now, sort of, I'm thinking in terms of, say, an exec at a financial services organization mm -hmm. who wants to bring automation and AI into the mix, uh, what advice would you have for them? What would, how do they start given your experience working with them and dealing with that? So I think that there's a couple of things and, and you know, uh, the model that I like to follow is always have conversations valuable enough that customers will pay for it. So I always want to say like, I want my advice to be useful whether or not anyone, you know, even, even say I'm talking to someone that just hates everyone at Indico's guts for some reason is never going to go with us, still want to have a valuable conversation. 
Um, so what I would say is that the most important things to recognize are that the we're, we're at like peak hype. And that means that the numbers you're seeing, right, what you're hearing from vendors, it's in the in, in vast majority of cases, is going to be dramatically inflated, right? Um, if you even think that 100% automation exists for a use case, you need a, a hard reality check, right? I think that is the, the most important thing that execs need, is they need a reality check. They have to do away with this notion that they're going to just like, run into AI and it's going to lead to this beautiful, fully automated future. And they have to get into actual dollars and cents and to think, how are we going to justify the ROI? What actually moves the needle here, right? You know, like what rates are important here and how do we want to do business in the future, right? And and it's not, it's not a genie. It's not a magic wand. You're not going to like, again, you're not going to wave a magic wand and just not have to have humans ever think about this problem again, right? You know, it's an accelerator. It's an enabling tool is really, you know, it's a, it's a bionic arm, right? It's an engine that makes you go 10 times faster, but still a human is controlling it in, in some way, shape or form, right? Um, so I think that's, that's the most important thing to recognize. And I would also say, um, we often deal with customers that may have adopted 12 other competitive solutions before going with Indico, where all 12 have failed, right? And, and I say that not, you know, and, and Indico does end up succeeding, but the important thing is just to recognize how high the failure rate is, right? So that, that sort of 25, 35% rate, that's actually for AI broadly. Um, generally unstructured use cases are held to be significantly more difficult. So, you know, that might even be conservative for what that failure rate is. So, and I, I would say in that context, um, the best time that you can spend is doing better evaluation up front. Um, like what I always say is like, if you are testing vendors on 30 documents, you are not testing them, right? Um, if you can't get at least 500 documents together to do a statistically significant test, then this use case is not valuable enough for you to get out right? Uh, and we'll do this on the Indico side, frankly, all the time, is we're just like, look, if you're telling me you can only get a dozen documents here, then the use case is not worth a million dollars a year, right? You don't care about solving it if you can't actually validate it appropriately. Because people will, you know, they'll decide that it's so important to do the validation for 50K instead of 60K. And then they blow $4 million on a solution that fails in production, right? When they could have solved it if they just actually spent the time to do the validation right at the start. So uh, th those are some Love it. Yeah. Love it. I love your focus on ROI as you think it's about the use cases and applications. <laughs> yeah, no, that's excellent. Uh, now, um, last question. Um, for advice for aspiring entrepreneurs, what would you tell the next generation of AI entrepreneurs? Um, what advice would you give them? Something that I think uh, more folks in AI need to be he need to hear is um, don't be afraid uh, to chase the frontier of technology. Um, I think that, and I realize this is this is it, it's risky advice in some ways, right? But it it can be very very intimidating, right, to see. Amazon and, and Google and Microsoft and all these massive organizations going after the field of AI and making these incredible advances. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs see that and they say, I can't contribute to this field, right? Um, and so they, they don't even try. What they don't necessarily understand is that every advance that is made sort of opens up a greater surface area of potential beyond it. So what's happening is that each advance actually allows you as an individual entrepreneur to build on top of everything that these organizations are doing, right? It doesn't stop your ability to make advances. It actually enhances it. And this is something that I see so, so many entrepreneurs doing is that rather than actually trying to take that next step, and in a lot of cases, it, it's not that hard and they're very capable of doing it, right? They get afraid and instead just say that, they're going to bundle whatever these large providers send out. They're not even going to try to understand it. And I think in, in most cases, that means they leave the really big opportunity on the table because they don't believe that they can advance the state of the art. And, and, and any entrepreneur that cares enough, right? I, I would say it is absolutely possible, right? I, I, I have met high schoolers, right, with, you know, $500 in compute, 
right, that have managed to advance the state of AI, right? And if they can do it, you can do it. So that's that's what yeah. I say. That is a great advice. Slater, it was a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you for taking the time.